Welcome to Charged Up Studio Live, where small business owners get charged up for success. Are you a small business owner? Do you find yourself struggling through the many responsibilities that come with the title entrepreneur? Well, we're here for you. Charged Up Studio is hosted by Market Academy LLC, your prescription for what we call OPA. What is OPA? It's when you become so overwhelmed with the confusion that comes with business ownership that you become paralyzed and ultimately avoid doing anything in hopes it will take care of itself or you put it off till later. Does that sound familiar? I'm your host, Dan Olivo, and each week we bring a business professional eager to charge you up as they talk about the many things that keep you from moving forward with your small business. So are you ready to get charged up for success? Let's hit it. Well, hello, Charged Up Studio listeners, and welcome back to another exciting episode where you get charged up for success. Today, we have a very exciting guest in the studio with us. She's an expert on the book, The Art of War by Sun Sun Tzu. And uh, I've read it a long time ago. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about it or read it, but we're going to get some, a different uh, interpretation of the book from our guest today. Having spent several years in the greater China region, she immersed herself in the Chinese culture, walking away with an intimate knowledge of the book and the 36 strategies revealed. She has become an expert in the interpretation of these strategies and how they fit in today's modern business world. Today, she's going to reveal her negotiation strategies through the book and how to negotiate to get what you want in business. Let's all give a charged up studio welcome to Miss Leone, Leone McKeon all the way from Australia. Welcome, Leone. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. I'm glad to have you here. It's going to be really exciting. So Yeah, it's going to be uh, great. I'm really I'm really excited about this. It's 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 just great. Thanks for having me. Well, I've me. read this I've read this book and and it really intrigued me, but it was hard it was a hard read. It was a hmm. difficult read. And Absolutely. so when you, Yeah, when you talked about you know, this book and how you had translated, and I, you know, I got excited because I want to hear your translation. It's the art of war has been, uh, how can I say, a, a, a platform for most successful businesses out there in the world, mm-hmm. you know, and it does give a lot of great insight and strategies. And as a strategist, naturally, I'm drawn to it. <laughs> so before we Absolutely. get started, do me a favor, for those who may not have read it or haven't read it in quite a while, can you give us a brief description of the book, The Art of War, and what the premise is behind it? Sure. Okay. The Art of War was written by the famous strategist Sun Tzu. Um, now, what I found, Dana, is that The Art of War has been written, you know, thousands of years ago. And it's been written in the warring times of the greater China region. So the interpretation of the situations of using the art of war are about emperors and, and you know, bows and arrows and riding horses and going over rivers and this kind of thing. And, and what I realised was that there wasn't actually an interpretation of saying, okay, well, this strategy, which is used, you know, thousands of years ago, how do we use this in the contemporary business world? I discovered the art of war in about the year 2000. Um, as you said, I've lived in the greater China region for several, for several years. And what I realised was that, and it wasn't actually until I came back to Australia, I got that reflection. And I think that is what travelling gives us. You know, when we go to another place, we come back to our own country and we reflect on what we've learned. And what I found was that Chinese people are very good at negotiating. I had been living around a negotiation culture for five years. 
and you know this daily negotiation not just negotiation but people feel comfortable about it that it is part of their life and so when I came back to Australia I went down the academic road I, so my experience is kind of upside down to most people so I did the I did the um, you know the experience before the academic and when I finished my anthropology degree I opened a business to help Australian people understand how to deal with China. And on one of my business trips to Shanghai, now I don't know whether any of your listeners have had this experience, but someone flows through your life in 10 minutes and they change your whole way of thinking and how you see the world and you never see them again. I met this man at a networking function and he said, Leone, let's go out for coffee. So we did. We were sitting in the Starbucks coffee shop in Shanghai, and I still remember that coffee shop when I go back to China, which I haven't been for quite a few years now because of COVID. I look at that coffee shop and I say, that's where my life changed. And he said, Leone, have you heard of the 36 strategies? And I said, well, the strategies that are derived from the art of war. And he said, yes. And I said, well, I can't see how these strategies have any bearing on the contemporary business world. He said, this is how this culture thinks, understand them to be an expert in the thinking of Chinese business negotiations. So there was my journey beginning in the year 2000. And I remember sitting on the aeroplane, coming back to Australia. And at that time, I had eight Chinese staff. We were doing translations and interpretations and workshops and this kind of thing. And I came back the, on the Monday morning and I came to the office and I said, hi, everyone. They're all sitting there. Did you have a good trip? And I said, have you heard of the 36 strategies? And they looked at me as if to say, now, in Australia, we have a, you know, we have koalas and kangaroos and Vegemite. You might have heard of that. And um, it was like saying to an Australian person, have you heard of a kangaroo? They looked at me. It is so fundamental in the culture. And that's where my journey began. So I started understanding and looking at these strategies that are derived from the art of war. There's 36 mm -hmm. of them. And so I spent at least a year interviewing Chinese people, talking to them, asking them, you know, about strategy one, strategy two, how does this work? Did you experience this? Anyway, so that took me a, a very long time. And then I started delivering workshops and consulting and using these strategies. Now, the strategies, the best way I can describe them, the strategies are like idioms. Now, an idiom in Western culture is don't cry over spilled milk. Right. Now, we know, we know what that means. But it doesn't mean someone is standing there crying and the milk is spilling. Yeah. It, it has an underlying code, which we know what it means. Now, the yeah. strategies are just like idioms. Fool the emperor to cross the sea, strategy one. You know, if all else fails, retreat, strategy 36. So they're like idioms. And so then I began their journey of understanding how these idioms and strategies work in the contemporary business world. Right. right. Well, you know, let's let's look at some of these idioms, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's look at um, in the midst of chaos, there's also opportunity. Yeah, okay. okay. What's your okay. translation so, for that one? <laughs> sure, sure. In the midst of chaos, now there's always that, that, that yin-yang kind of situation in Chinese culture. So... <clears throat> You know, in any kind of chaos, there will always be an opportunity. There's always, there's always, you know, the black and the white. You know, there's always the other side, you know, as far as Chinese business negotiation goes and Chinese culture. Um, a way of explaining one of these strategies, which I'll throw this in because I think this will give our, our listeners a very good, clear picture of how the strategy works, which... Um, you know, in the midst of chaos, there is opportunity done, it exists right across them. That's something that exists right across them. Let's look at strategy one. Okay. Strategy one is fool the emperor to cross the sea. 
fool the emperor to cross the sea. Okay. Every strategy has a story that underpins it. Just like, you know, just like our idioms. I'm sure there's a story that was, you know, thousands of years old about, you know, um, you know, don't fly the spilt milk. Okay. So Emperor Lee, thousands of years ago in the warring times, he wanted to fight Korea. However, he was too afraid to go across the sea. So his generals thought, how do we get Emperor Lee on the boat to go across the sea to fight in Korea? So they thought, what does the emperor like? He loves good food. He loves wine. He loves dancing. He loves singing. So they did the boat up just like a party. They put the emperor on the boat. He sang. He danced. He ate. All of a sudden, he was in Korea. He had no idea. He sailed across the sea. Fool the emperor to go across the sea. Okay, now how does this work in our own business environment? All right. I have just applied that strategy on our listeners. I said the strategies are like idioms. Now, now you know what the strategies are like because what fool the emperor to cross the sea is, it is taking someone through the familiar to get to the unfamiliar, all right? Because if you Sorry, just no. apply, if you just apply the unfamiliar onto someone, like if they just put the emperor on the boat and said, okay, we're going across the sea, the emperor would have froze. He would have probably had a panic attack. They wouldn't have got him across the sea, but they worked out what he liked. So what I've talked about is idioms, which means now that the strategies from the art of war, our listeners know that they are like idioms. Mm -hmm. So I've taken you through the familiar, which is idiom, which is an idiom, to understand something that is quite complex. So fill the empath across the sea can be used in marketing. You know, you've got a new product um, and it's quite different. So how do you get this product to your consumers without them going, oh, this is totally non-understandable? How do you get a product into the, into, the, into the community through something that is already familiar? So what is already familiar to your audience? Now, this can be with anything. This can be, you know, talking to an audience. This can be, um, you know, bringing people into your office who are from a different culture. Okay, where do they like to sit? What tea do they like to drink? So they feel comfortable because they are your emperor and you want to take them across your sea. Yeah. Now, and, and, and you know, storytelling is, you know, it, it, I can see what you're saying here because in the process strategically of creating those relationships, and putting yourself in your client's shoes. That's exactly what you're talking about here, is put yourself in their position. What's going to make them comfortable? Where Where is their pain points? Where are the pain yes. points? And yes. how, do you, how do you tap into those pain points, but with a story? I've been there. I know exactly what you're going through. You know, here's yeah. how I managed it. You know, that type yeah. deal. And then what you are is you're on the same page. Yeah, exactly. And if we use it in a Chinese environment, because um, I am a, I am a, a, you know, an expert in Chinese culture. I've studied Mandarin. I'm, you know, quite fluent in Mandarin. I've lived there for five years. I've got a degree in anthropology. Da, da, da. Three years ago, though, I started to widen my, widen my expertise so that this is negotiating in any environment. You don't have to be dealing with Chinese people. Right. But to give you the example in a Chinese environment, you know if you go to a Chinese, you know, okay, so for example, uh, you know, when people were going to China, uh, you get pick up, picked up at the airport. Um, people are very friendly. They take you in the, you know, they take you in the car. They take you to the restaurant. All of a sudden there's wine from Australia there. There's beer from Australia. You feel comfortable. You are the emperor going across the sea. Yeah. And when is in our Western understanding of negotiation generally if you go 
and meet your client the night before the negotiation is supposedly starting the next day. But with Chinese culture, you are always negotiating. So it starts immediately, which means you're sitting around the dinner table. You feel comfortable. You say, wow, this is easy. You know, people say dealing with Chinese people is hard. And then someone talks about the price. You say something that you don't want to say and you set yourself up in a way that you don't want to set yourself up for the next day. You know, so understanding that when you're in this environment with with Chinese culture, with Chinese people, that you need to be aware that these strategies are always in play. Well, and 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 speaking of this, I do a lot of international business, okay? Mm-hmm. And, and you're talking about China here, Australia, and things like that. And I've dealt down in Brazil and South America and, and over in, in London, you know, England and stuff like that. But what one thing that I learned very early on in my international travels is when I'm going to do work in another country, I need to adapt to their ways of doing business. I can't mm-hmm. come in and force my ways on a culture that's been established there. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, so therefore you have to do your research. You have to understand how you can negotiate, go in and negotiate with a foreign country and make them believe that you have the answers that they need. You know, as far as that's concerned, I know when I was working in Brazil, you know, I had to go in there and present what I had to say, you know, and things like that. But I had to do it in a way to where when they made a decision, they felt as though it was their decision and not me forcing it on them because they were a very proud country, you know, and yeah. yeah. And I, I know that the Chinese were working down in Brazil at the same time I was. Okay, and they were having a little bit of a difficult time because down there in South America, relationships are everything. Everything, yes. Everything. And so something that would take an hour here would take four hours down there. And so you had to be very patient. You had to, you know, and my experience with the Chinese down there is they did not have that patience. They did not want to, you know, uh, spend that much time because, you know, that's their culture. That's get culture. in, get and out, do the things that need to be done and, you know. What people have asked me over the years, um, Dana, is why are Chinese people good at negotiating? I say there's three reasons. The first one is that they are brought up in a culture where things are out on the street. You know, anybody that's been to these kinds of cultures in, in you know, in Chinese-speaking areas, um, you know, Malaysia, um, you know, mainland China, Taiwan, there's markets outside all the time. So from the time you're five years old, you're probably learning to negotiate, you know, just mm-hmm. from experience. The second thing is that most people are brought up in high rise. So children learn games with strategy at a very young age because they're not outside playing contact sports. So backgammon, mahjong, the game called go, chess. Yeah. They learn that from a very young age. Two, three, the 36 strategies derived from the art of war are fundamental in the culture. Now, people ask me, well, where did Chinese people learn this? Well, okay, my answer to that is, where did you learn don't cry the spilt milk? I don't know. Somewhere. Okay. Because it is not in a school program, all right? right. It is right. something that is fundamental in the culture. You can ask any Chinese person, have you heard of the 36 strategies? And I will guarantee they will say yes. Yeah, Whether they, they say yes. them or not. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, yeah. and what I realized was, over the years that many CEOs, you know, um, uh, CFOs, I mean, lots of people at that top end, executives have read The Art of War. However, like myself, um, I read it three times and I could not understand how these, you know, these ideas could be put into the contemporary business world. But I knew that that was definitely the key to understanding strategic negotiation. Right. Right, right. 
Um, so let's talk a little bit more about some of these idioms, okay? Sure. Um, sure. You know, what are some good ones that, uh, like I've got uh, ugh, victorious warriors win first and then go to war? Okay, so the strategies. strategies. Warriors go to war first? Yeah. And then now remembering. Yeah. Now, remembering what is coming from the art of war, um, the this, this strategies are derived from the art of war. Okay. They derive. So the ideas from the art of war make up the strategies, if, right. that, if that makes sense. Right. Right. Okay. So there's 36 of these. There's exactly 36. I told you about strategy one. All right. How about we look at strategy six? This is a very good strategy for real estate agents and property developers. All right. Make a noise in the east and attack in the west. Strategy six. Make a noise in the east and attack in the west. Now, these strategies may sound like war strategies, and they are. They are. But yeah. remember, they are you know, thousands of years ago. So they may sound like that, but they do have that underlying, you know, the, the coding which we're going to unpick right now. All right, make a noise in the east and attack in the west. Okay. So you're a real estate agent, for example, and you have a property that you have some good clients that you know are interested. However, the property is quite expensive. You know they can afford it, however you know that they're going to really push you in on this price and it's going to be quite difficult. So you research around the property, understanding what your client wants. So it could be close to the CBD. It could be close to kindergartens. It could be close to schools. It could be close to shopping centres, swimming pools. Understanding the needs of the client. You focus on those particular things around the property. So, you know, this property, um, you know, is close to, um, you know, a kindergarten if they have young children. It's close to a shopping centre. Yeah. Um, you only, you can use public transport if you want to. And you focus on that and make a noise in the east and attack in the west. And then what happens is that by the time you get to the price, they're sold because you focus so much on other things. Right. 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 So you've made a noise in the east and an attack in the west. You're not saying, oh, well, this, you know, this property is, you know, a million dollars or whatever. And they'll go, mm -hmm. oh, say, so, okay, you never discuss the price, okay, until you've discussed everything else that 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 your potential clients are interested right. in. Right. 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 No, definitely. You know, it's it's um. It's it's difficult to translate these things, but when you when this number six that you're talking about, the first thing I thought about make the noise in the east. What was it? Make the noise in the east. Make, make a noise in the east and attack in the west. Okay. So and and the first thing I thought about is distraction. Yeah, exactly. The first thing I thought exactly. about, you know, let's distract them from the price. Exactly. And let's focus on the positives, the value, the you know everything that brings that at, contributes to the price. Exactly, exactly. You know. and I've had you know, uh, I mean, Chinese in a Chinese situation. Let's say, let's say I get this pencil here, made mm -hmm. in China. All right, I'm not happy about the price. So when I when I communicate with my contact in the factory. I, you know, I, I go in there thinking that I'm going to I'm going to adjust the price because it's getting too expensive for me. When I get into the meeting, the person that I'm dealing with talks about everything, you know, the color, the size, everything else except the price. So what happens is then I leave the office and I haven't even discussed the price. Yeah. Oh, the other way. Now, there's another way that that can happen. They might say, yes, surely, Oni, no problem. We shall put that price down a bit. That's fine. You're a great client. However, see that casing there? We might just have to use a different material because, you know, that's a that, that will bring the cost that's down. That's an expensive piece of material. Think, well, yeah. Right. And then you have to think, well, 
you know, the my end consumer is now getting a lower quality product. Now, the yeah. way to deal with Chinese people with this strategy is to keep them on track. I came yeah. in about the price, you know, understand that this strategy is in action. But make a noise in the East and attack in the West is absolutely about distraction. That's right. And yeah. what what I want to what I want to really um you know uh really say, Dana, is that these strategies are not about I win, you lose. These strategies are about collaboration. All right. Yeah. They are about relationship and collaboration. This is what negotiation is about. It is not about do, 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 I win, you lose, all right? Right. It's right. all about collaboration, and it's about collaboration and relationship. You know, yeah. talk the, the real estate agent talking about, you know, everything except the price means that they have actually understood their client. It doesn't mean they're trying to win and they're going to lose, all right? It means no. they really have made made a good, you know, done a good job in understanding your client. Yeah. And, and again, that boils down to the relationship and putting yourself in their shoes so that yeah. you can relate to, you know, what they're, you know, what they're coming to you for, you know, yeah. so that you yeah. can negotiate on a level, level playing field is basically what it is, you know. Absolutely. Um, yeah. One yeah. Of the, no. A great strategy. One, one of the, stra what, well, I love all these strategies, but one, the, one that I would like to really share with you all, uh -huh. with your listeners mm -hmm. is strategy 30 exchange the role of guest for that of host exchange the role of guest for that of host now what that means in business is when you are the host you are in a power position all right yeah. now think about it this way when you go to a dinner party the host sits you down you don't question the host about the food, all right? You are the guest, mm -hmm. okay? So moving yourself from guest to that of host with your clients is a very good place to be. It's a powerful position. Um, I'll give an example. Tradespeople. Okay. Uh, we have a plumber, Greg, all right? And if something goes wrong with the house, and I don't know over in the US there, whether, you know, you have trouble with tradespeople. But, you know, yeah. getting tradespeople in Australia isn't exactly the easiest. easiest no, it's task. not here. We, we've lost a lot of them. They don't you call know. you back yeah. or whatever, you know. But Greg yeah. is always reliable. And um, if we have something go wrong, like the gutters, um, we've had a lot of rain over here and, 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 and our gutters uh, were leaking. And I just called Greg up and said, you know, come up, can you come over and fix the gutter? I, I'll, leave, I'll leave the keys in wherever. He fixes it, he leaves. I don't even ask about the price. Yeah. Greg is now the host. It's trust. Yeah. 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 Greg you is created now the host. that relationship to where you trust him. Yeah. Yeah. So, how do you in business, if you think about this way, how do you in business think about? the relationship so that you are the host. And what I often ask my clients is to look at the clients that you have and which clients are you the host for? Right. And you'll find that you're actually the host for a lot of clients. Um, yeah. And then which ones aren't you the host and how do you move into the position of host? Because being the position of host is a very good position to be because you are the trusted provider of the service. Right which means that you're probably not going to be questioned on price because they trust you that you're right. not going to rip them off or whatever. And, and as a strategist, you know, and I am dealing with my business clients, you know, with my clients, um, they have to put a lot of trust in mm. my keeping their secrets and keeping, you know, uh, um, you know, keeping that, that, that veil, okay, of what they confide in me you know, to ourselves, you know, so that it's not shared. And that's extremely important when you're in the position that I'm in. And it sounds to me, that's what you're talking about. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that trust position. I'm talking about, you know, yes, it goes into confidentiality. Absolutely. It also goes into being such an expert in your field that you do the job that they want you to want them right. to do. Like the right. plumber, I can throw the piece to Greg. I know when I get home, it's done. It's not right. going to leak anymore. Right. 
you know, and he sends the invoice, that's fine, no problem, you know. Um, and so being in that position with clients, um, you know, is a is a very good position to be in. Um, um, you know, it's and it's interesting when you connect up with other hosts because I was speaking to um uh, one of my, because um, uh, I'm a conference speaker and speaking to one of the bureaus here and, um, you know, the person said that they they are very, you know, they are um, one of the people that are very respected inside that because they've worked there for 11 years and she liked what I did. So it's very good to be connected with those kind of people because then they could say, well, you know, Le I think Leonie's got some very good stuff here, you know, so you connect up with hosts that have actually got the power then to take you to the next place. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So let's look at another side of negotiation, okay? We, we talk about uh, our actions and things like that. What other influences are there out there that can... Uh, basically determine how a negotiation is going to take, you know, or or go, like where you have the negotiation. Is there, yeah. you know, a rule as yeah. far as that's concerned? Yeah, strategy 15, lure the tiger down the mountain. Um, who is the tiger and what is the mountain? So the tiger is you, you. The mountain is your comfort zone. And how far are you going to be lured outside your comfort zone? Um, because the Chinese have a saying, on the plains, the tigers are bullied by dogs because tigers don't live on the plains, they live in the mountains. So yeah. lure the tiger down the mountain. So what mountain are you going to come down? So, for example, in negotiation, um, you may let's say you 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 know you, you are in a particular city and the people that want to um, negotiate with you uh, you've always met in this particular city this particular location and then they want to they want to take you out of that location and you know it might be or come and see our offices or something like that so you really have to think about location because Location is a very significant point in negotiation because we all feel comfortable, you know, we feel comfortable in our own environment. When we are taken out of an environment, we may have to, you know, find a new hotel we stay in, you know, a new restaurant that we always use or, or whatever or that we're going to use, um, not the same one that we always use, you know. So we need to think about how far we want to go down that mountain. And if 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 we're being taken down the mountain where we feel uncomfortable, we need to push back. You know, right. that's that's really that's really um you know very important. And how okay. you can take your 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 um you know the person that you're negotiating with you may want to take them you know out yeah. of their out of their comfort zone. You know I was um uh, one of my clients in um, Adelaide in South Australia uh, are medical professionals and um, it's about putting a product into hospitals that is going to improve the patient journey. And I'm sure that, you know, you probably had the same situation in the yeah. States. We've yeah. got a lot of hospitals here that are overcrowded and da-da-da-da, you know, yeah. and it's that kind yeah. of thing. Um, and so I've been working with them on this product and um, and one of the things they need to do is to get other doctors on board because you know sometimes they just oh you know I'll just yeah. do my job and then I'll go on and, and that's it yeah and talking about doing that getting the doctors into a location that's outside of their hospital you know um, inviting them out to another coffee shop to another location so that they can get them around something else you know, so that they're not continually in their own environment, which then puts the person that, you know, that's trying to bring them on board in a position right. of, of, you know, um, sort of being in a lower kind of position to them. Whereas if they bring them into another environment, they're going to have a lot better success about talking about this product. Very interesting. So, you know, um, 
a couple of couple of things have come up based on our conversations. Okay. I don't know if it would fit within the art of war and the tactics here, but how do uh, how do you handle a a difficult client, okay, mm -hmm. who is terrible at communicating? All right, yeah. and always complaining yeah. that things aren't going right. How do you yeah. how do you communicate that in a way to where you you negotiate, uh, I don't want to say negotiate because that's not what you're doing. You're doing it in a professional way to get them to see where the real problem is. It's not with, you know, you or something like that. They've got to take a look back and reflect back on how they're responding. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I do. I, I know what you mean. Um. Well, I think this is a strategy for, um, you know, strategy one, fool the empty across the sea, because this is really about knowing about that client, um, because they may always they may always be complaining. They may be, and I, I don't I don't disagree with that. However, there will be something that that client likes. There will be something that that client is passionate about somewhere along the line. Yeah, it could be. It could be movies, it could be theatre, it could be yeah. wine, it could be flowers, it could be swimming, I don't know. It could be martial arts. Finding out what makes that client tick in a way that they are not complaining and right. then focus on that. So this is about finding out much more, you know, not just about the business but about um, you know, about the surrounding things of, you know, if they're yeah. interested in gardens, what did you do on the weekend? Were you, you right. know, were you in your garden? Tell me about it. You know, I've got a garden too. Get them into that zone. So fill the empathy across the sea. Bring them through the familiar environment before you get into the other stuff. Right, right. No, yeah. and I agree with you. You know, a lot of times these, these, um, uh, Areas that I'm referencing to the the uh, miscommunication, you know, and things like that. It usually comes out in times of stress, it and does. and that's exactly what it does. They start firing off, you know, saying I don't understand this or I don't understand that, and having to take a step back and explain to them the processes and the strategy and why we're doing certain things because mm. this is what you wanted. You know that you know those are all strategies that I know come from the book, mm. you know, they come yes. from the well, book. Well, this, you know, um, one of the things that I've been studying a lot of, and um, this is probably indirect, indirectly answering this, um, Dana, but it's about concentrating on you. Yeah. About you as in the client, you, you know, um, and so, it's about what you do, what you've achieved, what you like, and really focusing on them um, because sometimes people get to a point where they go, oh, my God, this is, and, you know, they're in a stress a stress position and Stressing. they might, yeah. their, 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 um, their reaction is to complain. But if we reflect on the past, you know, like the last five years, look what you've done in your business. Yeah. Look at the yep. things that you have achieved. Yeah. And you know, you, you know, two years ago something happened and you you did this, and that is fantastic. So, you know, in this yeah. position here, it's easy for you to do this again. So almost take them back into a reflection yeah. process. So yeah. they're able to look at what they've already done. Yeah. Familiar and, and, environment. Yeah, and that's where the stress comes in is they're focusing on what's happening right now rather than where they've come from mm. or what's still ahead, you know. Um, take them through the familiar, take yeah. them through what they, you know, it's like the marathon runner. I can't run that five kilometres. Well, hang on. You ran 10 last year. What's wrong now? Mm -hmm. You don't have a sore leg or anything? It's yeah. just all in here. You know, yeah. so take them back through the familiar so they can see what they've done. And, you know, we all do this sometimes, you know, when 
you know, we all go up and down in business. You know, we've all had situations with COVID. You know, I, I think that we could all give oh, yeah. ourselves a, a big pat on the back and say, hey, we got through this. Yes. Somehow yes. we got through this. Yeah. No, you you're know, right. Um, you're right. So yeah. um, we're coming up pretty close to the end of this. Um, let's okay. talk about um, when should when should I display my knowledge as an expert in the negotiation process? Where does that come in? Is that the storytelling? Okay. okay. Um, well, that depends. Um, if you're dealing with Chinese people, probably you don't. Um, look, this is, you know, for me, for me, I am a negotiation expert, so to speak. So I label myself as that. Um, there, there are no surprises. What does Leonie do? This, what, this is what she does. Um, what I do is, because quite often, the, you know, a typical scenario where people will come to me and let's say they've been, um, they've got a contract that is coming up and they've had the same price for five years and they want to up the price, but they're scared because they might lose the client, you know, this right. kind of thing. Right. Um, so what I do is I scope the project and then I choose five of the 36 strategies that I am going to use on this project and I discuss these with my client they don't have to know the strategies because that's too much to ask you know um but I say this is the this is the this is the methodology that I use and I describe them and then we go through the process so for me um you know and what I think is really important to understand with this is negotiation is not this piece in the business. It is a whole way of thinking. Negotiation is a whole way of thinking. It is not just this piece where we think, oh, well, we're sitting at the boardroom table and we're haggling over something. Right. No, right. it's when you meet the person, when you go out for dinner, um, when you're talking. You know, it, it, this is all about negotiation, about setting up the relationship. So I think, you know, the big things are, you know, collaboration, relationship, because if you go through one deal really well, you're going to get another deal and yeah. you're going to get another deal with that company and then you will become the host and yeah. the company probably won't ask you what you're charging because you are the host. You yeah. Know, so, but, and, and again, that, that comes with the relationship development. If, if they feel comfortable with you, and yes. your expertise and you, you, you know, like with me as a strategist, I've been there, I've done that. I know what mm. you're going through and I hit the nail on the head every time we're talking about, you know, uh, issues that they're facing, you know, and things like that. Um, yeah, that just strengthens the, the, um, the relationship and the, and ultimately what you want to do is you want to develop these loyal fans of your you clients. Yes. Yeah. And I, I would suggest also, you know, to maybe, you know, for anybody's clients, um, you could, you know, you could ask them, who are the people that you really trust? Okay, yeah. my doctor, my dentist, um, yeah. you know, the person that does my glasses. Um, my hairstylist. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly, your hairstylist, um, you know, my plumber, uh, you know, um, yeah. there's a whole range of people. But then there's some that you think, Okay, and then you hear people say, "Oh, you know, I had my website website done, and it was a nightmare." And da 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 da. Well, well, those people, well, those kind of companies that have treated people that way will never be the host. They will always be the guest, and they yeah. will always be looking for new clients. But if you can think of those people that you've got that you already have put trust into, then you want to be like them. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. Okay, yeah. all right. No, excellent, excellent. Um, you know, this is this has been a very interesting conversation. One last question I have sure. is when we're dealing with negotiations, you know, should we, we be using outside advisors for assistance or consultants or business development? Yes, I think this is like, um, you know, 
you use an accountant for your books, um, you use a lawyer, you know, to, to um, you know, to set up, you know, whatever structures you need, you, you use an insurance company, you probably use an IT person, I think, um, especially in Western culture, because we don't, we don't have um, the structure of the 36 strategies. Um, we also embed it into our culture as a fundamental piece of piece of knowledge. Right. Um, we also don't have the, um, you know, the luxury of being brought up as a child on games of strategy, and we also don't right. have that out in the street culture. So we are already, you know, we are already 100 steps back. I mean, you, if you think about it, my, I know in Australia, and I can't speak from America, from America, but I know in Australia, you know, 99% of the people, the times they negotiate Dana are for a car and for a house, really. That's it. Yeah. Okay. No, those are now, the main things. Yeah. Two times. How often do you buy a house? Well, not no what well, unless you've got a lot of money. All right. Yeah. Um, how often do you buy a car? You know, and, and this is really it. This is it. And you hear people yeah. say, Oh, you know, I tried to negotiate with my insurance company, I couldn't get the price down or whatever. Um, so I think to bring in an expert is is absolutely um you know a really good thing to do yeah so, and okay. you know just for your listeners um the art of war there's my books six of them um Very and they each, each book has six strategies and they are the strategies that are derived from the art of war in a way that's understandable if any of your listeners aren't. No, very good. And and yes, we're going to put the um, the link and everything on how mm -hmm. they can uh, reach you, reach Excellent. get your books, mm -hmm. all of that into. Yeah. Um, so any last minute tips you can give our listeners here? Sure. Look, I'd like to just throw, um, I'd like to actually throw um uh, I'd like to throw a strategy nine to you because uh, this has been a strategy that has really uh, been um, something that COVID has really exploded on. Strategy mm -hmm. nine is called watching the fire from the opposite shore, all right? Watching the fire from the opposite shore, which means that some of the businesses didn't cope with COVID, you know, some didn't. And so when you watch the fire from the opposite shore, you watch what's happening. Okay, so for example, if you're a wine bar and you know that the wine bar in the next suburb isn't doing well because they haven't put the strategies that you put in. So maybe you can offer them a price to buy their wine bar so that, you know, you can increase your business and also help them because they're, they're sort of going downhill. So you have to watch what is going on, watching yeah. the fire from the opposite shore. Always watch because there may be opportunities. I mean, we have um, uh, in South Australia, we, we have a big uh, wine wine culture here and we also have uh, gin. And the gin distilleries realised that they had the technology, a lot of them, not all of them, the entrepreneurial ones, to make hand sanitizer. So that's what they did. Exactly. And they made a lot of money. Yeah. And they yeah. really Look for supported those opportunities. the community. Yeah. Yeah. So watching the fire from the opposite shore means always watching because there could be opportunities for you where someone else doesn't have your expertise and you right. could possibly help them and increase your business. Right. That's one of the things that I teach a lot of my clients is the fastest and easiest way for you to scale your business is to strategically partner with other Absolutely. businesses. You Absolutely. know, and things like that. Because, partner and because sometimes yeah. you'll have the, you know, you'll have the skills that someone else might have and they might have the location that's better right. than yours, you know. So um, just keeping an eye out because sometimes, you know, we all do this in our business. We can get in this zone of our right. own stuff and we may not see outside that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. So um, do me a favor and tell our listeners how they can get a hold of you. Sure. Okay. So my website is um, is uh, leonimckeon.com. That's L-E-O-N-I-E-M-C-K-E-O-N.com. And my email is leone at leonimckeon.com. Please send me an email. I'm on LinkedIn, um, Leone McKeon on LinkedIn. 
uh, please, you know, reach out. i uh, love to talk with you. Um, and uh, thank you uh, very much, Dana, for also considering the time, the time difference here in Australia because it's um, it's yeah. 9.15 in the morning here and Dana has been very, very the kind on my, on my the time. The next morning. Uh, yeah, uh, on the next morning, that's right, the next on morning, my time yeah. schedule. So, um, but look, I'd really love to talk to talk to yeah. one of you or um, you can go onto my website and you'll just see the book section. There's um, all of the platforms, you know, Amazon, um, you know, all of the uh, the um, e-book platforms, you can buy hard copy, soft copy, right. whatever. Right. Um, but yeah, I'd love to, love to connect up with you. Just connect on with LinkedIn. We can have a chat on LinkedIn, whatever, you know. Love to. Well, as I as I said, we'll be putting all of her contact information into the transcripts that are going to accompany this this podcast. Right. So, you've been listening to Charged Up Studio Live, the podcast with you, the small business owner in mind, with your host, myself, Dana Oliva. Join us every Tuesday as we bring valuable tips and insight into many of the topics that you don't know you don't know about growing a successful business. Please leave us a review on any of the streaming platforms you are listening on or visit us on YouTube or Facebook and leave a review or subscribe so you won't miss another episode. You can support us through Patreon by visiting our website, Charged Up Studio Live, and click on the Patreon link. Until next week, go out and have a Charged Up week. Thank you once again, Leona McKeon. You've been listening to Charged Up Studio Live, the podcast with you, the small business owner in mind, with your host, Dana Olivo. Join us every Tuesday as we bring you valuable tips and insights into many of the topics you don't know you don't know about growing a successful business. Please leave us a review on any of the streaming platforms you are listening to or visit us on the YouTube or Facebook page and leave a review or subscribe so you don't miss another episode. You can also support us through Patreon by visiting our website, chargedupstudio.live and click on the Patreon link. Until next week, go out and have a charged up week.